so growing up, I always cringed when an imam, whether during a khutbah or at a bond burning fundraiser, uh, would veer into topical or political terrain. Um, I, I don't know what it was, but it seemed like whenever this context arose, there would just be this compulsion on the part of whoever was holding the mic uh, to just exaggerate, to cherry pick these facts and weave together this astoundingly self-assured narrative that, oh, just so happened to verify whatever their particular perspective was. Uh, now, you know, I don't want to make this seem like it was just a mosque-only kind of affair. Uh, if you gather a handful of Nasser era Egyptians, you know, over for dinner, you'll pretty much get the same force at work. Um, you know, it gets to the point where after a while, I kind of lose track of all the American, Israeli, Iranian, Martian conspiracies there are out there. Um, oftentimes, my eyes would actually hurt from how much I was rolling them during the conversation. <laughs> So suffice it to say, I built up a pretty healthy skepticism to the accepted wisdom of my aunties and uncles. You know, that's not necessarily to say that they didn't have valid points, but it's just that it would get lost in all the muck. And I gotta say, you know, across the landscape of American Muslim discourse today, I often see the same, you know, self-inflicted impairment at work. Um, you know, basically it comes down to the fact that, you know, when we're addressing the issues that concern us the most, uh, we just don't seem to be doing it in the most effective, most efficient manner. And so what I wanted to highlight today is three ways in which we can progress in our dialogues, in our activism, what have you. Now, I'm not going to provide particular solutions to specific problems, uh, but more so a general set of considerations, right? Uh, perhaps something that can help us along in our cumulative effort. Uh, and to be sure, you know, I can go on and talk about, you know, various other tweaks and frameworks, but, you know, rule of three for comedy. So. Uh, the first way uh, that I believe we can make better use of our resources is just by not summarily accepting uh, the terms of a debate as others set them. The script goes something like this. There's a Muslim group somewhere perhaps in the Middle East, Europe, America, that perpetrates an act of violence. As a result, Western commentators or an assorted selection of professional ex-Muslims uh, comment on how you know, they, ha they feel very concerned that Islam played a heavy role uh, in their action. In turn, Muslim analysts and academics dutifully produce you know, a series of retorts, uh, expending time and energy that perhaps would have been better placed questioning the very premises of the arguments that they were arguing against. So just to make the arc of this script a bit more concrete, let me give a case in point. The recent Is ISIS Islamic debate. In brief, a cover article in the Atlantic magazine analyzes the strategic implications of the so-called Islamic State and offers among its conclusions that ISIS is not only Islamic, but very Islamic. And man, this thing was like the New Age Helen of Troy. It just, an article comes out and it just launches a, th a thousand blog posts, right? And you know, among them, it's Muslim scholars and columnists who turn to textual, historical, and political evidence to make their case that ISIS is anything but Islamic. Yet few of these well-intentioned respondents question what exactly it even means to call something Islamic. Fewer still interrogated the article's fundamental premise, namely that ISIS being Islamic is in any way uh, relevant to policy or military strategy. How much needless effort could have been saved and you know, had someone merely pointed to these fatal flaws in the argument rather than accept the terms of the debate wholesale? We simply have to be more prudent with how we allocate our resources. The second matter that we should be mindful of is the distinction between magnitude and frequency. A problem may be significant, right? It may be well worth our attention, but it may not be widespread. And trust me, you know, as a social scientist in training, I know full well the temptation to generalize, right? Um, but we have to realize that these logical leaps can be counterproductive. They can force us, for instance, to underappreciate more pressing issues or overcompensate on the ones that we do address. So we can agree, for instance, that you know, young Muslims straying from the faith is a critical issue. But do we really know to what extent institutional alienation factors into this process? And are these circumstances confined to a particular locality, or are they more systemic? I mean, every generation for a millennium, right, has had this crisis of our youth narrative. Is ours all that different? My point is that without systemic assessments, we're left with anecdotes, hunches, intuition. 
And it may very well be informed intuition. But frankly, at the end of the day, even that's not all that reliable in the long run. And so that brings me to my third and final point, and fair warning, this is where I get in my soapbox a little bit. I believe that the action that will give us the most bang for our collective buck is to build a deference to data in our community. Now, this is certainly no panacea, right? Uh, for one thing, as my first point highlighted, access to all the data in the world is not going to benefit us if we keep acquiescing to these unproductive debates. And to be sure, self-assured aunties and uncles will always have their creative interpretations no matter what data we present them. Um, and similarly, any data that is divorced from the lived reality of our community can confuse more than it clarifies. That's why we need systematic information about our community gathered by those mindful of the nuances within our community. This is true at the local level. Every mosque needs to be surveying its constituents on a regular basis. How else can they meet their needs? And it's true on a national level. How can major Muslim organizations represent our desires to policymakers and social influencers without knowing who we are, what we want? And so I urge us, first and foremost, to support those individuals, institutions, and initiatives that are already working to remedy this deficiency. You can make your checks out to Yusuf Shahood, that's CH. Um, but beyond that, you know, I hope we can encourage more young people to pursue a career in the social sciences. I often hear Wajahed Ali uh, talk about how following 9-11, there was this push to get more of our youth into journalism uh, so that we wouldn't have to rely on others to tell our story. Well, as someone who empirically examines American attitudes and behaviors, gosh, I wish I could rely on the work of others. Uh, a lot of folks are studying what Americans think of Muslims, but few put in the effort to gauge what Muslims themselves think. And if more of us are engaged in writing this imbalance, then I am confident myriad, ba uh, myriad benefits will accrue. You know, a lot of problems we see in the American Muslim community today are simply a function of growing pains, right? Um, as you know, our demographic and ideological makeup becomes more complex, there are naturally going to be difficulties and obstacles that we run up against. But when such issues arise, we have to be vigilant, right? We can't just go straight from discovery to advocacy because that can only take us so far. To solve a complicated problem, you need both advocacy and evidence. If we can get this balance right, if we let empirics rather than intuition be our workhorse, then we can really shore up the foundation of Islam in this country. And in the process, perhaps save the next generation of skeptical Muslim youth a lot of eye strain. Thank you.